Welcome to the Vedanta Society of Providence Sunday service. Peter Travisano will do the opening song, We Are One in the Spirit, and then he'll talk about his journey in India. But we'll start with the opening prayer, if everyone wants to join along. We offer our salutations to the all-loving being who endows all beings with consciousness. We meditate on the Lord, who is the origin of the universe. Lord, thou abidest in all, thou art all, thou assumest all forms. Thou art the origin and goal of all, thou art the self of all. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss, salutations unto thee. May the world be peaceful, may the wicked become gentle, may all creatures think of mutual welfare. May their minds be occupied with what is spiritual and abiding. May our hearts be immersed in selfless love for the Lord. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. So we'll open with a song um, called We Are One in the Spirit. And I chose this song for two reasons. One, it was a favorite of Swami Sarvagatananda, who we'll, we'll uh, make reference to a number of times during this um, conversation about India. And um, also, I think it really speaks to um, one of the themes that I'm going to be talking about tonight, which is the spirit of the Ramakrishna mission in India, which to me really emanates from the divine loving consciousness which is in all of us and manifests itself in um, the loving service that they perform throughout India. So we'll start with this song. We are one in the spirit. We are one, we are one. We are one in the spirit. We are one, we are one. And we're all mother's children in the sun, in the sun. We all can help each other by our love, by our love. We all can help each other by our love. We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will this day be restored. And we know we are God's children by our love, by our love. We know we are God's children by our love. We will walk with each other, we will work side by side. We will walk with each other, we will work side by side. And we'll sing the song until the words are echoed far and wide. Till all people are united in one love, in one love. Till all people are united in one love. So this um, presentation was entitled um, The Journey in the Himalayas, but we're only going to talk about the Himalayas a little bit. Actually, there's going to be a lot of bonus content, which was <laughs> not about the Himalayas, but about um, traveling through uh, many parts of India. And um, first of all, I loved India, and I've never, I had never been there before. So in 72 years, I'd never been to India, although India, for so much of my life, was just this spiritual mother. 
because um, every time I, my, my interest in spirituality really goes back to, you know, understanding that unity in consciousness, you know, you might call it cosmic consciousness or, you know, experiencing the Atman, but um, all of that seemed to me always, as I looked into it, it always seemed to emanate from India somehow, one way or the other, whether it was in Hinduism or Buddhism or through the wonderful work of Mahatma Gandhi and his um, you know, nonviolent practice. All of those things meant so much to me, and it really was only just a matter of time before I found Vedanta and Ramakrishna because all of those, um, all of those paths really lead back to Thakur, I think. <clears throat> So, um, first of all, how many people here are from India? Okay. And how many people here have been to India? So, everybody here knows at least as much about what I'm going to be talking about as I do. So, I would say I would love it if this conversation was as much a conversation as it was a presentation. So, let me just slide back there. So, um, also special thanks to um, Swami Yogatmananda who made so many arrangements for me and put me in touch with all of the um, many places that I traveled to. <clears throat> You'll notice that most of the places that um, uh, I'll be talking about really had to do with staying at one of the Ramakrishna missions throughout India, which was a tremendous eye-opener to me about the wonderful work of the the missions in India. You know, here in the United States, <clears throat> most of the Vedanta experience is really around teaching spirituality. But in India, it's really about service. And I was tremendously impressed with that. So I don't know how many Ramakrishna mission sites there are in India, but I believe there are more than 200. And um, it's very well known in India. And um, you say Ramakrishna in the United States and not many people will know about that, but in India, it's very well known in terms of um, uh, the service that um, uh, the, the mission provides. <clears throat> so a pretty ambitious schedule. Um, landed in New Delhi on October 25th, just about the same time Teresa showed up. I think she actually found out where I was going and made other arrangements, so <clears throat> uh, cause our paths did not cross. Uh, went to the Konkal Ramakrishna Mission, where my guru, Swami Sarvagatananda, spent uh, almost 10 years, back in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, traveled to Rishikesh, really, which was kind of a launching area to um, my Kedarnat trek. Was in um, at Kedarnat from um, the 2nd of November until the 5th of November, November, then to... Um, Varanasi, staying at the Ramakrishna uh, mission in Varanasi. Ooh, this thing keeps getting away from me here. From um, November 7th until the 10th, then to Bel Moth for four days, um, where I was able to experience Bel Moth, Dakshineshwar, and all of the holy sites around uh, Kolkata, which was really wonderful. Then to uh, Kamar Pukar in Jairambadi. And then... Um, I'll introduce my friend Damien through this um, presentation, but he is a um, long-time, 50-year uh, devotee of Mer Baba. So in Merabad, <clears throat> in Western India, we spent some time, um, you know, with him sharing his uh, experience of, uh, of his path, which was really wonderful in and of itself. So the purpose of my trip was, among other things, to commemorate my guru, Swami Sarvagatananda, in his service at the Ramakrishna Mission in Kankal from 1935 until 1944. <clears throat> and to commemorate Swami Sarvagatananda's guru, Swami Akandananda, and his Himalayan treks following the passing of Sri Ramakrishna from 1897 to 1997. So during that formative time that um, the, 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 the Ramakrishna order was really begin, beginning to develop, Swami Akandananda was really in the Himalayas. 
and only later I met up with his um, um, beloved Swami Vivekananda um, uh, after he returned from the United States and, and Europe. <clears throat> and um, to see firsthand the work of the Ramakrishna missions in India and to explore Mother India, which I mentioned was so much a part of um, you know, my spiritual experience over the years. So two inspirations, as we mentioned, Swami Akhandananda and Swami Sarvagatananda. Swami Sarvagatananda, <clears throat> for anybody that uh, th doesn't know, was um, born in um, 1912 and um, came to the United States after serving um, the Ramakrishna mission in um, Konkal and in Pakistan. Uh, he had previously, prior to that, spent um, a considerable amount of time with Mahatma Gandhi and um, was on the Salt March. I think, I, I think he had three personal audiences with Mahatma Gandhi. So he was involved in the Indian Freedom Movement um, back in the early days and then devoted his uh, life to service in the order. <clears throat> Swami Sarvagadananda, for those that knew him, um, we're blessed to have the experience of a, of a really illumined soul. He was a, a loving being and um, from, from my experience with it, was a very enlightened person. And that was a blessing to have had a chance to um, spend time with him in my lifetime. <clears throat> and then his, his guru was Swami Akhandananda. So he was a disciple of a direct uh, uh, disciple of uh, Ramakrishna's. I remember when I first met Swami Sarvagatananda, I kind of figured, sized up his age, and I said, you must have actually known people that knew Ramakrishna. And he said, yeah, Swami Akhandananda was my guru. And I was, that, that was pretty impressive to me, that's for sure. How many people here had a chance to meet Swami Sarvagatananda. All right, so quite a few. All right, well, that was a blessing. Any stories about Swami that anybody would care to share or any impressions? Yeah, Abhijit, go ahead, yeah. We'll pass the microphone around from time to time, so yeah. Um, so we, we have a vision yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, he was 22 years old. And then uh, he was the youngest uh, brahmachari in Kankal with Swami uh, Kalyanananda. Swami Akhandananda sent him to Kalyanananda to be trained because Swami Sarvagatananda told Swami Akhandananda, I want to uh, work under a karma yogi. Yeah, he said, I'm not a scholar. I don't want to be a scholar, but I want to work as a karma yogi. And Swami Akhandananda said, if you want to work as a karma yogi, I will send you to the best karma yogi in the world. And that is Swami Kalyanananda at Kankal. And Kalyan Maharaj was a student. He was also about 21 or 22 when he met his guru, Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda sent him to Kankal. And Swami Vivekananda at that time told Swami Akhandananda that, uh, you know, I have seen so many of the Swamis and sadhus in the Himalaya region. And uh, they need a lot of physical help, medical help. And they don't have anybody to uh, rely on. So you go and there start an ashram. So Kalyan Maharaj, along with another uh, Swami, he started the Kankal Ashram. Now it is one of the biggest hospitals. So yeah, it's really remarkable. Yeah, so I don't want to take up too much of your oh, time, so. Uh, no, that's a, that's a perfect introduction to what I'll be talking about. And um, two inspirational books that really kind of informed my journey was one, and these are certainly well worth reading, In the Lap of the Himalayas, which is the story of Akhandananda's journey in the uh, Himalayas. And he went so many places. Actually, he traveled through the Himalayas to Tibet barefoot. So that's almost uh, incredible. And... Um, Another book that we'll be referring to is a wonderful book 
that I would certainly recommend, and it really tells the story of a, a of a Swami Sarvagatananda's formative years in the order, and all of his time uh, with Kalyananda um, at the um, Ramakrishna Mission in Kankal. And there's some wonderful, wonderful stories in, in these two books. So, I landed in New Delhi. And, um, you know, I'm kind of a, I come from a small town of about 1,500 people. And I was in culture shock, for sure. <clears throat> I don't know how many people live in New Delhi, but and maybe... maybe 18 million, okay, 18 million people. And I landed in New Delhi, and um, I've got this smartwatch that tells me when my heart is beating abnormally. <laughs> and it was going off, like, continuously, because this was, this was, didn't feel like home to me. So I remember getting, going from the airport to my hotel in, um, right by the New Delhi train station, which is a nice, quiet little corner of town, right? <clears throat> so we're going through this mad traffic jam and um, probably took like two hours to go, uh, five miles. And in the middle of it all, there were cows crossing the highway. And um, it was pretty different from anything I'd seen before. So <clears throat> definitely culture shock when I got to uh, New Delhi. Um, but not far away from um, the um, hotel that I was staying at for a few days was this quiet little place in New Delhi, the New, the, uh, New Delhi Ramakrishna Mission. And in the middle of all of that chaos, there was this island of peace and serenity and something I could really relate to. And I couldn't quite find the temple itself, but what I found initially was a, um, there was a, a work area, and they were teaching um, kids how to use computers and uh, developing technological skills. So this was a good introduction to the, um, um, oh, this thing keeps moving around, um, to um, the Ramakrishna mission. And <clears throat> I didn't do a whole lot of sightseeing in New Delhi, but the people in New Delhi were just so sweet. And I kept hearing, you know, be careful in India, be sure to keep your money in a money belt and don't trust anybody. But everybody that I met on the street in New Delhi was, was really great. And the, you know, I, I, these guys would walk up to me and just start talking and I was thinking, whoa, you know, these, I'm gonna get ripped off here. But all they wanted to do was find out where you're from. If you're from America, that's great and take a selfie, and at, at the most, maybe direct you to their um, father-in-law's tuk-tuk um, stand or something, but uh, you know, everybody was just so sweet. And um, I'd walk along and I'd see these bands of, um, of kids walking along and they just would, you know, be so, so, um, you know, wonderfully cheerful and I, I just loved being there. In fact, my experience of India was just, this undercurrent of um, of love and peace, even in the in this chaotic setting, which India often really is. You know, there's one and a half billion people in a space about a third the size of the United States, so it's crowded, and um, there's a lot of commotion, <clears throat> but there's also a lot of harmony in India, and a little quiet street scene, which was nothing like my town of Phillipston, but there's wires hanging down and people going in every possible different direction. And of course, the traffic. Pollution, yeah, that was something new. So usually the, um, um, you know, I was actually checking the weather forecast and around here, you know, the, um, the pollution index is about 30 or 40, but in New Delhi, it's about 400. And I felt like I had a cold the entire time I was in India, so I was always blowing my nose, but. So, um, traveled to Konkal, and um, special thanks to Prasuna for arranging my train ride, so she was very helpful. Actually, Prasuna 
you know Prasuna, she's a devotee who comes here very often. Her, her uh, family lives in Konkal, and unfortunately I wasn't able to meet them, but um, did speak with them by phone, very, very lovely people. <clears throat> so I wanted, we mentioned um, Swami Sarvagatananda and his um, connection to the Konkal um, Ramakrishna mission. I just want to read you the story of how, <clears throat> how Swami Sarvagatananda got to Konkal. So he was with Akandanandaji in um, Mumbai in um, 1934. And um, I'll, read, I'll read the following passage. It was later in the year in Mumbai, in November 1934, <clears throat> that um, he met, this is, this is all a biography from this absolutely wonderful book that I have fallen in love with. It just, um, this is just moving around too much. Um, it just came out this fall, and it was uh, compiled by Swami Tyagananda up in Boston. But these are um, uh, conversations that Swami Sarvagatananda had with a um, woman who became a Vedantic uh, nun. And <clears throat> the, the sharing in this book is so completely spiritual and so completely simple that it's just, it's just wonderful. I was talking with um, Abhijit about it this afternoon. We both had the same experience. We can only read about a page a day because it's just so deep, but it's a, it's a wonderful book to read and I really highly recommend it. I think I'll be reading this <coughs> for the rest of my days. But anyway, he had, Swami Tyagananda has a wonderful biography of um, Sarbhagatananda and he says this, it was later that year in Mumbai in November of 1934 that he met Swami Akandananda, who was to be his teacher, mentor, and inspiration. Just a few meetings with Swami Akandananda were enough for Narayan, who was, that was the original name of Swami Sarvagatananda, to make up his mind about the future course of action, which was to lead to a life of spirituality and service. Swami Akandananda recommended that he join the Ramakrishna order branch in Konkal, a suburb of Hardwar on the bank of the Ganga, which would provide an ideal environment for Narayan's monastic life to, to flourish. And the Konkal branch was primarily a hospital where the monks served as a part of their spiritual practice. It took a few days for Narayan to figure out the best way to reach Konkal, as there was in those days no direct train to it. But Akandanandaji found that Narayan hadn't yet left for Konkal, and the reason for the delay, he commanded Narayan to walk to Konkal on foot, not travel by train. Akandanandaji himself had walked hundreds of miles in the Himalayas and assured Narayan that it was best way for him to prepare for his monastic vocation. He also specified three conditions, to do no sightseeing on the way, to carry no money, and to subsist on a single meal every day. With Swami Akandananda's blessing and firm determination animating his heart, Narayan set out on December 3, 1934. His experience during the long walk from Mumbai to Hardwar are the stuff of legend and are clearly cherished by his students and devotees. It was an arduous walk of nearly a thousand miles to be done with bare feet. Some description of the, it can be found in the absorbing book, You Will Be a Paramahamsa. The long walk was filled with hardships. When Narayan reached Nasik, he met a monk named Nepali Baba, who advised him to wear an ochre cloth in order to make his journey easier. Narayan hesitated since he hadn't yet been formally ordained. Nepali Baba told him that nobody becomes a monk. You either are or you are not. In your case, you are. December 14th, 11 days into his walk, Narayan's endurance was tested. He reached a breaking point of exhaustion 
And thinking that death was near, he lay himself down under a tree with a prayerful heart and fell asleep. He was awakened by someone who, seeing his condition, lifted him up and took him on a bus to a town named Dulia. There Narayan was taken to the house of a lawyer whose home he discovered a shrine dedicated to Sri Ramakrishna. It turned out that the lawyer was a disciple of Mahapurush Maharaj. Narayan spent the night before the altar looking at Sri Ramakrishna, weeping profusely at the grace that he was being shown with what a stranger noticing him, picking him up, and driving him to the welcoming home of a devotee. This incident completely changed Narayan's outlook on life. He said later that he had faith, but his faith had become real that day. Quoting the Gita, he would say that the Lord literally carried him that day. After this inspiring situation, his walk to Conkle thenceforth had no major problems. He walked barefoot, slowly and steadily, with firm determination, reaching the Conkle Ashram on February 7th, 1935. He was welcomed by Swami Kalyananda, who told him that Swami Akhandaji had written to him saying to take care of this boy. Under Kalyananda's loving tutelage, a firm foundation was laid for Narayan's monastic life. So this is Swami Kalyananda. So he was a um, direct monastic disciple of Vivekananda, and he founded and led the Ramakrishna mission in Kankal from 1901 to 1937. So as um, Vishnath was saying, he was sent there by Swami um, Vivekananda. Vivekananda told him, forget about uh, Kolkata, and he certainly did. He never returned to Kolkata or Bellarmouth, but spent the rest of his life in selfless service in uh, Kankal. So this is the original Kankal mission. And this is a, probably exactly what Swami Sarvagatananda saw when he um, came to Conkle back in uh, 1935. So it's just this simple um, house, and that really was the, um, um, the home of the, uh, the uh, hospital. So they would serve about 30 patients there at that time. This is the current hospital, and I um, couldn't really get a picture of the whole hospital, but now it has hundreds of beds, serves people from um, you know, the entire uh, Conkle Hardawar area and is really a, a, a major center for um, um, health and service in, um, in that area of India. And I love that uh, quote on the um, uh, front of the building, service to man, the service to God. So there's the, the beautiful Konkal Temple, which is very sweet and very simple and um, just lovely. It's just wonderful to be able to go in there in the morning for prayer and meditation and RRT, and the same thing in the evening. Um, just really a lovely place to be. And since I was right next to Haridwar, um, got a chance to uh, take a dip, a dip in the Ganga at um, Haridwar, so that was my first experience of uh, the Ganga. But it's a beautiful place on a beautiful day, and... Um, Really, really great memory of hard, hard war. And uh, this was in the middle of the um, Cricket World Cup, right? And uh, so I guess people are playing cricket all the time anyway, but this is kind of a typical situation where people are playing cricket with a box for, I guess, a wicket. And I enjoyed uh, watching these guys play, and they were pretty good, I can tell you that. So, from um, uh, Konkal, I was able to jump on a bus and go up to Rishikesh, which is about 20 miles north of um, 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 Konkal. And I uh, spent really um, between Rishikesh and Kedarnath, which was um, close by, I spent uh, quite a bit of time there and, and really loved it. So, th this was. I had a really beautiful room, kind of in the yoga district of Rishikesh, where all the 
people, the Western yogis come to practice, and um, it's kind of a, a nice part of town with an elevated view, and the, um, the guy that uh, was the manager of the hotel says, yeah, you ought to come out on the balcony at sunset. It's a really nice view. So perfect view of um, the Ganga at sunset from my room. And my roommate, <laughs> or my would-be roommate, who was always trying to come in and um, seemed to think that we had a great relationship. I wasn't really so sure, so he didn't, he didn't come in too often, but he, he did seem nice enough. And a lot of sadhus in, um, in uh, Rishikesh. This was a, a particularly gentle soul who was always uh, right down by the Ganga. And um, I enjoyed, uh, you know, seeing him. And I just felt like, what a, what a peaceful person. He was just always there. And um, I don't know how he, how he managed, but um, it just seemed like such a really blessed soul. So Kate or not. Um, so, I first heard about Kedarnath in reading um, Swami um, Akandananda's book, and I said, well, you know, maybe that's something that I could do. So, I um, had no idea what to expect or what that would be like, but I knew Kedarnath was one of the four principal um, pilgrimage sites in India, and it seemed like it could be a really um, incredible journey. So I figured, well, if I could possibly get to Kedarnath somehow from uh, Rishikesh, I'm going to try to do it. So we, we went up to the uh, Kedarnath Temple, which um, goes back into an antiquity quite a long ways. By legend, it was um, built by the Pandava brothers. So I don't know how back and far in time that goes. But, but we know that the temple is at least, um, goes back to at least eight, the year 800. And if you see the temple itself, it looks like it probably is in, in far older than that. Um, I mean, to have survived a minimum of <clears throat> 1,300 Himalayan winters is uh, pretty incredible. Um, and really just a beautiful and inspiring place. Um, when I went there, <clears throat> it was early in November, so it was just about at the end of the season where um, uh, you could uh, visit. They closed the Kedarnath Temple um, at Diwali because it's just the weather's just going to be too cold. It's going to it's going to be impossible for people to safely trek up there. So it was just really at the end of the season. Um, as I was making the trek, the snow was beginning to come down, and um, it just made it so beautiful. The snow was just uh, covering the, the Himalayas, and they're not very, and they're not too far distant. Kedarnath's at about 12,000 12, feet, but right behind it, like you could almost touch them, are Himalayas of about 22,000 feet. So it's an incredibly beautiful spot. So here's the path to Kedarnath. So you start at the village of Kedarnath, which is at about 6,000 feet, and make a trek to 12,000 feet. And this is over a distance of about, um, about seven miles. So you're traveling at about 1,000 feet per mile, which is steep by any standard. That's about a 20% grade. I couldn't really visualize what this path would look like. You know, I'm thinking more like New England hiking trails. But this is a ver it's a wide path. Um, literally, thousands of people make that trek every day, which is amazing to me. But it's a testimony to the devotion of the Indian people, absolutely, because this is not an easy thing to do. So... Um, Really quite, quite an amazing thing to see. Some go by foot. Some go by horse. Some go by helicopter. <clears throat> and some even travel in baskets. People, yeah, uh, Teresa's looking at me. But yeah, some, of, some, of the, some people that can't walk or go by horse travel in a basket on the back of somebody that carries them up. So... 
It's quite amazing. And when you get to Cater Knot, because of the, the length of the journey, um, you really can't go up and down on the same day if you're going by foot at all. So there's tent sites up there. So hundreds of people are staying overnight in, in the tent sites. So really quite an amazing place. I felt really blessed to do it. It was not easy to get to Cater Knot from Rishikesh. It's a distance of about 120 miles, but it took us two days to do it because the roads are not good and uh, there are multiple rock slides all the way. So one, one rock slide we ran into closed the road for about five hours. And then on the same trip, we had another rock slide that probably had a stop for about eight hours. So we were only able to get part of the way to Cater Knot the first day. Um, and then we were able to make it the second day, do the trek, and um, come down the, um, the next day. I was really blessed by to have a, a driver who um, drove me out there, and he he'd never done the Cater Knot trek before. He said, "Yeah, I'll go, I'll go up there with you." So he went up and did did the entire trek with me. Spent the night in the tent. We walked back down, and I was blessed to have him because there was a lot of ins and outs about that trip that aren't obvious, and he was he was just extremely helpful. So. Then from Kedarnath to Varanasi. So <clears throat> here's the uh, Ramakrishnan in Varana Varanasi. And again, um, you know, a wonderful hospital there and a beautiful um, shrine. Um, but, you know, they serve hundreds of people in um, Varanasi. And those of you who have been to Varanasi know that <clears throat> it is, you know, there's, there are the ghats and then there's the city the city is extremely chaotic. But walking into the Ramakrishna mission was very peaceful. It was just a nice island um, um, in the midst of a, of a very busy city. So Varanasi Mission Shrine, beautiful. So again, you know, the um, concept of service and, um, and um, you know, living a deeply re religious life. We met a doctor at the um, in the dining hall who um, wasn't like any doctors I have ever met in the United States, but this was a doctor who, um, you know, he had a regular practice, but every week he came into the mission, dedicated it, you know, donated his time for free. And um, you know, I think that that's essentially how a lot of the service is provided by, you know, local people and medical people who just donate their time because it's, it's, that's what they want to be doing. And Varanasi from the Ganga. So, one of the oldest cities in the world. Mark Twain said, um, Benares is older than history, older than tradition, and older than legend. In fact, it looks like it's twice as old as all three put together. And... Um, you know, I've never been to Rome or any place like that, but to me, Varanasi was just walking through, you know, history. Just a really amazing city. And I um, loved it. So, um, <clears throat> here's a view of the gods from um, the Ganga. And a cremation god. So, the crema cremation gods are very real and tremendously poignant to see, um, you know, people's cremations going on, the families there, um, but just all out in the open, um, both very beautiful and very touching. Um, so that was a very moving experience to be able to witness that. <clears throat> and my friend Damien, who I met up with in, um, um, Varanasi. So Damien has been a good, very dear friend of mine for 50 years. He is a very deeply spiritual person. And he's been to India. I think this was his 14th time visiting India. So having <clears throat> Damien around after traveling India for three weeks by myself was a joy and a comfort. So the rest of the trip, 
Damien and I were traveling together. Damien was tremendously impressed by the organization and the work of the Ramakrishna missions as we traveled around. So also in um, Varanasi is Sarnat, which as you probably know, was where Buddha first um, did his public teaching. So in the foreground there, you can see what were, were probably where, where the monks lived. And um, uh, so that was basically a community of monks. In the back, there's a kind of a tall um, structure that's um, the stupa where Buddha first gave his first uh, public talk. So it's a very sacred place. Um, and it was really beautiful to visit there. So there's a museum in Sarnat, which was amazing, but a lot of, um, um, just beautiful, and a lot of Buddhist artifacts, a lot of Buddha's um, um, bones were there, and um, just just a tremendously powerful experience. And then, of course, got to meet up with some more Indian kids, which we always enjoyed, so definitely some charming visitors. And there was a, we just loved this chai guy who was out in front of the Ramakrishna mission, but he had the best chai ever. And he always had a smile on his face, so we never failed to uh, uh, get chai from our friend there. And I, you know, that I was amazed that they served chai in these um, terracotta cups, which um, are great because, you know, they basically eliminate any litter, so you just drink from the the um, terracotta cup and toss it away, and um, but that was great. And he was he was he was just kind of a wonderful uh, person to uh, be able to see every morning. Then to Bellarmat, and this was right in the middle of Diwali. So here's De Bellarmat, <clears throat> decked out in 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 full Diwali regalia. And really beautiful. The lights were just fantastic. And some monks and uh, brahmachari kind of enjoying the um, Diwali scene there at Bellarmat. And some, um, some young ladies enjoying the Diwali lights. And the beautiful um, hall at um, Bellarmat, which was just completely amazing. And the Ramakrishna shrine. So this was all during um, Kali Puja. So lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people at um, Bellarmat. And I can tell you one thing, um, you don't get a whole lot of sleep in Kolkata when it's um, Kali Puja because they don't just set off firecrackers in the evening. There are bombs going off until like 4 o'clock in the morning. And um, I mean, it was, it was loud. And uh, so maybe about, I, I think the local ordinance was they needed to stop setting off the firecrackers at, at 11, but... Um, yeah, that just was not going to be happening. So, yeah, a lot of celebration and um, a lot of very enjoyable, but not a lot of sleep. Beller Guest House was a great place. And the, these were our fellow um, guest house friends. Um, every one of them really brought, you know, their own lifetime of spirituality to, um, you know, coming to Bellarmat. But um, in the center, there's um, an Indian-American couple who are just lovely. Um, the gentleman in the gray um, shirt was from Brazil. You know, a wonderful devotee with tremendous enthusiasm. Uh, my friend Damien in the um, <clears throat> blue shirt in the back. And the woman on the far, um, I guess, right um, was really an amazing person. She was from Hungary. 
She uh, had just completed translating the Gospel of um, Sri Ramakrishna into Hungarian. Very dedicated soul. And um, it was re really a pleasure to get to know her. But um, everybody there was there for a reason, and they were, you know, really wonderful devotees. So, <clears throat> this was a real, I mean, if I didn't do anything else in India, or for that matter, in my lifetime, going to Taker's room was just something that was of great personal importance to me. You know, in, in my meditation, I'm in Taker's room. That's where I met, you know, that's what's going on. And, uh, you know, so many hours of just sort of being there and spending time with Taker and all of the, um, um, you know, original monastic disciples and M and all of the people that are mentioned there. You know, I just felt like that was very real in my life. And to be able to see that just meant so much to me. And uh, it was really, really wonderful to, to be there. It's a funny thing. <clears throat> it was Kali Puja. So at the Dakshineshwar, there were thousands of people. And they were all at the Kali Temple. And no one was at Taker's room. It was just, I thought, you know, I'm never even going to get close to the place. But there was, you know, that was, that was not why people were there. And I was, I was really surprised about that. But I spent a lot of time just being with Taker during that day. And that was, that was just a wonderful experience. And I can't even describe it. So that's how much that meant to me. In the Kali Temple, <clears throat> where Ramakrishna, of course, was the temple priest, which was quite grand, but didn't really compare to being in the presence of Taker in Taker's room. <clears throat> then we took a trip over to um, Barangar, and um, where the original, I guess Ramakrishna Moth actually was. So this is a picture of the uh, direct disciples back right after um, Taker's passing. Looked like a pretty rowdy bunch of young guys to me. <coughs> and this is what the building looked like back in those days. So they say it was haunted by ghosts and people would not even want to walk past the place. But um, that was the, uh, that's where the um, Ramakrishna mission got its um, humble beginnings. And this is what it looks like today. And, um, you know, service going on there all the time. It's a moth for, for monks and um, a lot of service to the area. Um, so it was really great to see that. And we took a little side trip to Holy Mother's home in Kolkata, which was wonderful. I just want to read a little something that um, Swami Sarva got on to said that just meant a lot to me. <clears throat> he talked about the Holy Trinity, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and Holy Mother. And um, he said, Ramakrishna is truth in its totality, God in his fullness. Vivekananda represents presents the truth in a philosophical and scientific way that any rational person can accept. Holy Mother is not an instructor. She is an exemplar. She followed Ramakrishna's teachings to perfection and embodied them for all to see. And that's really how I look at Holy Mother, but with all of the challenges that she had in her personal and family life, I mean, she really was in the same boat as most of us with her her family and uh, a lot of the difficulties or health-wise that she faced, but she faced it all um, just with kind of a perfect attitude and, and um, you know, did it, did it so beautifully. I think, I think there's so much we can learn from Holy Mother and 
uh, it was a blessing to spend time um, at, um, at her house in Calcutta. In her shrine. And then uh, we um, traveled to Kamarpukar and to Jairambadi. Um, I loved being there. These were so different from being in the cities of uh, India. I mean, Kamarpukar and Jairambadi are like islands in the middle of a sea of rice. That's really how I looked at it. But, you know, they're not, not very big towns. And you can really see what, it, it, not that different from probably the way it was in some ways back in the 1880s. You know, there are people out um, harvesting rice. There were, a lot of that rice was moving by, um, you know, by wagon, by horse, or by mule. Um, so things are not entirely different. It was wonderful to see Ramakrishna's family compound where Ramakrishna grew up and spent his time and the, their, their temple. I mean, that to me meant so much to be able to spend, spend time there. And <laughs> took a little dip in the, in the Ram Kamarpurkar tank. So I got to um, jump in and take a pretty, pretty good swim out there. This was November, but still plenty warm in India. So um, loved being there and loved being at that tank, which is so, so much the source of um, Ramakrishna's stories, both in the Gospel of Ramakrishna and uh, his biography. So it was really wonderful to be there. And Jairambadi. <clears throat> so this is where Holy Mother lived in that compound. <clears throat> Her bedroom. This was one of my favorite places. Which this was Holy Mother's Ganga. There's a, a river. Does anybody know the name of that river that goes through Jairambadi? Hamalda. So <clears throat> this was like a about a quarter mile walk through a rice rice field to get to. Um, uh, get to that river, but that river is just so beautiful and peaceful and calm. We just, um, we made multiple trips out to the river just to be in that beautiful place, and it was just wonderful to be there. And I can just picture Holy Mother, <clears throat> given her challenging life in Jarambadi, you know, just being able to get away, sit by the river, and find some uh, moments of uh, peace. And amazingly, you know, I thought Jairabadi was just going to be this like little, tiny little place, which in, as far as the town goes, it is. But it's unbelievable how many devotees go to Jairabadi. I mean, in truth, more than, more than Kamar Pukar. And um, uh, so this is just breakfast on a typical weekday morning, I guess. Uh, but so many people coming to um, Jairabadi, I think... You know, the, to me, it speaks of the growth of the of people's appreciation for Holy Mother over over the years, really, and um, it was really wonderful to see that. So, <clears throat> hundreds of people there, really, all the time, and it was just a blessing to be experiencing that in the Holy Mother Shrine. Quite a big temple there, actually. And then uh, <clears throat> took a trip out to Western India, to Maharashtra, to spend a little time with um, at uh, Maribad, <clears throat> which is the home base of the uh, Maribaba um, uh, movement. So just a, <clears throat> a few uh, pictures uh, from there. So we were at Maribad, which is a lovely place, and we took a little side trip up to Alora, which um, were these caves that <clears throat> the all of the all of everything that you see here uh, it was carved out of rock inside the cave and there are 30 some caves um, in Alora some were carved out by the Jains some carved by the Hindus and some carved by the Buddhists and all at the same time within 
probably a half mile of each other. So all of these religious traditions were kind of harmoniously working in the Indian way, I think, um, you know, building these incredible temples that uh, were just amazing. But, you know, 30 plus temples that were uh, carved into the hillside. Alora was kind of a, a um, caravan route traveling down from um, Pakistan and uh, probably Afghanistan along the trade routes uh, down toward um, Delhi. So people would stop there. This was my favorite cave. This is a Buddhist singing cave. So you can see the ribs on the ceiling. And you, if you chant in there, it doesn't really echo, but it's just sort of, it just has this incredible vibration in, in the building itself. So it, it's almost like the top of a guitar. It's not an echo, but it's a, it's a, it's a very spiritual vibration. So as you're chanting, whatever you're chanting, Om or whatever, the the um, the cave just becomes alive with that chant. So, really amazing, actually. <clears throat> and this is Marabad. Um, this is where um, Marababa, who um, you may know, he was considered by some to be a you know well obviously a, a very deeply illumined person and um, an avatar. <clears throat> this uh, building here is his uh, samadhi shrine. Uh, where he was buried. And uh, under that canopy, people would gather every uh, morning and evening for uh, worship and to spend about 45 minutes singing. So people would just bring their own, whatever songs they had, Western songs, Indian songs, people would just uh, sing there all morning and all evening, which was kind of a beautiful experience. <clears throat> so that's where we ended our trip and um, wound up... Um, flying back to Boston. And if I had culture shock when I got to Boston, when I got to India, I had culture shock when I got back. I'm I kind of, my wife picked me up at the airport and I'm looking around saying, all the traffic's going in like the same direction and uh, where is everybody, you know? I, I, I took, me, um, took me a while to get, it's, it's so quiet around here. So, um, but I loved it. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be blessed to um, go back to India again, but um, it was really the experience of a lifetime. And um, thank you for letting me share. And if anybody has any questions or comments. Yeah. Yeah, you just showed the Amodar River. Excuse That's me? One of, the, one of the most beautiful rivers, Amodar. Amodar, yeah. Uh, yeah, near Jarambati. And then I'm reminded of one incident when Babu Ram, that is Swami Premananda, uh, he was going to meet Holy Mother. So on the way he saw beautiful lotuses blooming on the Amodha River. So he stopped his journey, went there, collected as many lotuses as he can. If I remember correctly, he collected 100 lotuses. So, but, and so when he took all that lotuses, he knew that Holy Mother and uh, Thakur loved the lotuses. So he took it, and then even before Holy Mother looked at the flowers, he started screaming, Oh, Baburam, what did you do? She said, and then he did not even know so what he did. So, and then, look at you. So he looked, and then he said, My God, blood was pouring out from his body. Wow. So many pores in his body. So, and then yeah, immediately Holy Mother said, take Babu Ram to the doctor nearby. So, and then he left everything, ran to the doctor, and the doctor said, oh, these are all leeches. The Amoza River was full of leeches, mm. and they were, they were still sticking to his body. So many of them, dozens of them. And then blood was oozing out from every pore, <laughs> and, then, and the doctor said, don't worry. So he called a villager. And the villager said, oh, this is a common occurrence here for leeches. And then I can cure that one. He said, bring a piece of cloth. So they brought a piece of cloth, and he burnt it. And he took the ashes and smeared it over all the punch, punch wounds. And then the blood stopped immediately. Hmm. So that's a very you know, uh, striking incident. That's one of the small incidents when Holy Mother was really scared. 
So she said, am I going to lose Babu Ram? <laughs> so it was so much blood was there. Mm. So. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. so many stories that you hear from people right. that actually yeah. knew people that knew people that were, you know, with Holy Mother at that time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So thank you so much for letting me share my experience and um, it's, been, it's been a blessing. Thank you. Okay, um, what we have coming up is Swami Yogatmanandaji will be back on, Tuesday, on Monday afternoon, so we'll have the Tuesday evening class on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, the Friday class on Srimad Bhagavatam, and next Sunday is February 11th, right? Oh! <laughs> well, I don't have the March. March 10th, we have. Oh, March 10th, we have the full day's worship of Sri Ramakrishna to commemorate his birthday. That was easy enough. All right, so, um, and we also have morning and evening meditation. The door is open in the back for that. And uh, I'm all shut up, Ajit. Okay, so the closing prayer. And, and afterwards, you're invited to have arati in the shrine. Leave your shoes where you are. Um, we don't like them piling up at the door. And then we'll have soup supper afterwards. So we'll have the closing prayer. May the divine, everybody can join in. May the divine, who is father in heaven of the Christians, holy one of the Jewish faith, Allah of the Muslims, Buddha of the Buddhists, Tao of the Taoists, Great Spirit of the Native Americans, Ahura Mazda of the Zoroastrians, and Brahman of the Hindus, lead us from the unreal to the real, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. May the all-loving being manifest himself unto us and grant us abiding understanding and all-consuming divine love. Peace, peace. Peace be unto all. Stay.
hidden and ornamental world Consciousness is a form Your eyes always purified by knowledge Your eyes always purified by knowledge Looking at them Illusion is gone Ocean of shining love and feeling Ever inebriated In your infinite love Your feet always dear to your devotees Your feet always dear to your devotees form a boat to cross this world reveal to us as God incarnate and the Lord of all things helping us join with you your Minds always set in the divine light. Your minds always set in the divine light. This we can see through your grace. Destroyer of a worldly sorrow and come. Passion soul, infinite is your world. Your life's offered for the world's deliverance. Your life's offered for the world's deliverance, saving us from darkness and fear. Renouncer of all lust and lucre Therefore you were always spurning sensual light Lord of monks you are the best of men Lord of monks you are the best of men Grant to us pure love for you Your fearless and your free from doubting With your mind very firmly resolved Causeless refuge of your Causeless refuge of your devotees Renouncing cast and burn Our treasure is your holy feet Which take us very soon Across this puddle of life you give love and even sightedness. You give love and even sightedness to remove our anguish here. Our treasure is your hope. Feet which take us very soon across this puddle of life. You give love and even sightedness. You give love and even sightedness to remove our anguish here. Greetings to you, O Lord, beyond. Old speech and mind 
Greetings to you, O Lord, beyond both speech and mind. Yet you are the basis of both. O Lord, yet you are the basis of both. Great light of all lights, blessing in the heart's gift. Great light of all lights, blazing in the heart's gate. Darkness <coughs> is destroyed by your... <coughs> oh Lord, darkness is destroyed by your light. Greetings to you, O oh Lord, beyond both speech and mind. Greetings to you, O oh Lord, beyond both speech and mind, yet you are the basis of both. O oh Lord, yet you are the basis of both. Great light of all lights, blazing in the heart's gift. Great light of all lights, blazing in the heart's gift. Darkness is destroyed by your light. O oh Lord, darkness is destroyed by your light. These are all the sounds I'm redundant. These are all the sounds I'm written. Spiritual songs, devotees are singing for your worship divine. Spiritual songs, devotees are singing for your worship divine. Joy, joy, for your worship divine. Haru, haru, for your worship divine. Shiva, Shiva, for your worship divine. Breaker of all worldly bondage and adored by all. We adore you too. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai. Come seeking rest. 
refuge from anguish be a savior through your deep concern all our suffering remove god Yeah. 